Hi, welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and today's show is going to feature my guest, Joya Sosnowski, sound healer and trauma releaser. The Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Awards. We are right now a finalist for a Coalition of Visionary Resources Award, and I fly to Denver the weekend after next as one of the finalists to go to the awards ceremony. And we were listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to. And thank you so much to all of the uh, these outlets. Really uh, doing the work I do, it, it actually means a lot. It means a lot to hear from them. And it also means a lot to hear from you. So thank you, thank you for always posting your comments. And I feel like I get a lot of love and great feedback there. And I read all of them. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. And if you'd like to become a facilitator or attend one of their classes anywhere globally, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com or accessconsciousness.com. And I'm Debbie Dashinger. I teach business owners, speakers, healers, and entrepreneurs the highly effective steps to write an engaging, page turner book. I just finished teaching a two day book incubator and sent some new authors out into the world. Uh, very exciting to see people come in and be really nervous and not know what they're doing, but know that they're called to write a book and then leave feeling confident and savvy about the book that they are writing. That means a lot to me. I also take each author's book to a guaranteed international bestseller. I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And finally, I teach you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. I've got some classes coming up in that. And why don't you start by getting my free gift so I can give you the templates and the videos, how you can start doing these things out in the world. Go to debbie slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift. So how to be liberated from suffering to become a vibe raiser. My guest is Reverend Joya Sosnowski, who's a metaphysician and sonic synthesis practitioner devoted to expanding consciousness in the higher self. Having overcome severe trauma herself, she employs extensive trainings in mindfulness, healing with sound and voice, metaphysics, and spiritual psychology to assist people in releasing all forms of trauma and reconnect with their true soul self. In addition to her sound healing practice, Joya hosts Singing Circles, a spiritual study group on Monday mornings and the Vibe Razor event, where people come together to raise the vibe of the collective consciousness through chant and dance. And boy, don't we need that now. Her first book, Practical Spirituality, 15 Practices to Bring Heaven to Earth, is due out this fall. If you'd like to learn more about her and her work, go to viberaiser.com. And I welcome Joya to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you here. Debbie, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be sharing your space with you. Thank you. Yeah. For a million reasons, you're the right gal for the job right now. Uh, you are actually my first sound healer and first sound healer who's going to actually do some sound healing for people later on. Ooh, super wow. excited. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to fill that spot. Oh my gosh. And when we were first, when we were talking before the show started, you mentioned the trip you just came back from and I, I could feel, I could feel that this was transformative. And so I know you've been to Spain. I would love it if you'd share, why did you go to Spain? What were you mm. doing there? What happened? Wow. So uh, a couple of years ago, I think it's been two years now, I was reading a book because I, one of my deep passions and studies is studying the Aramaic teachings of Yeshua. So the original language teachings. And one of the writers is Lars Mule. So I love his writings. And so I was reading this his book crazy. and I- Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I just got his book. How is this possible? I literally- Oh my gosh. 
Okay, so in his book, there was a quote from a sound healer. And so I Googled and I said, well, who is this? Who is this sound healer? And it turns out it was his wife. And he made a documentary about her on YouTube called The Note from Heaven. So I watched this documentary and I felt I just had this feeling on me that was like, oh, I love this woman. I need to know this woman. I am going to study with this woman. I said this, and this was in 2020, right? Right when this, when the the thing that shall not be named started. And I <laughs> was like, I don't know how this is possible, but I'm going to study with her. And so she did an online, like she rolled with everything going on and we did a Zoom study. So I studied with her on Zoom uh, this past August of 2021. What, was, what is her name? Her name is Gita Bin David. Okay. And so I then um, after that, that was really profound. But then I found out that she was doing a live training in Spain in 2022. So I I text I immediately sent her a message and said, I'm coming, save me a spot. And so I went and I was in this beautiful retreat space in the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life in Spain and with a uh, 18 other people who were there who were just some there were a few professional singers some sound healers people who just went because they wanted to find their voice again and she her whole philosophy is uh, teaching us this um she calls it the note from heaven and she learned it in india where you just chant one note and if you continue to do this practice that it's all of a sudden you just you find that this sound that you're singing starts singing you is what happens really the vibration changes from it it's almost like an emptying out of yourself and the sound starts singing you and you start singing overtones and it sounds like there's three people singing with you but it's just you and so i got to spend a whole week with people doing this practice of singing together and then also using sound on the body with your voice. So we were learning to uh, do a, a vocal sweep of the physical body of the meridians and you can hear, you could hear um, the, the, the vibration change, the resonant change, the resonant sound would change in the body. And then you just ask, you, you know, you ask for guidance from the quantum, from the field, from source to flow through you to help this person, whatever their body needs, what they need and the voice changes. And I'm telling you, Debbie, I made sounds that came out of me that I could never duplicate. I could never replicate sounds like that if I were to sit here and try to do it because it was what the that person's body needed while I allowed myself, my ego self to get out of the way and allow the nafsha, which is the Aramaic word for soul, to my nafsha to connect with their nafsha to tell me what this person needed. And it was really a week of deep work, very deep energy work. Um, just such a such a blessing and such a gift to be in that space and to be able to go and learn this from Gita hands on and work with her and with so many other talented, creative, passionate souls who were all there for the same reason. It was just beyond anything I could have ever expected. And I can see that you're like so blown away. <laughs> On more levels than you can imagine. And we will get to them. Boy, were we supposed to meet. This is, everybody in the moment is watching a no accident happening, like synchronicity. Mm. Incredible. Because I'm so deeply compelled and <laughs> I want to say chasing, but that's really not the energy, but I'm hungry. I can't actually get enough information about Mary Magdalene and Yeshua. And mm. um, the fact that you would even bring up this author who I never heard of before, but because I was digging deeper to find more information about Magdalene, his name popped and I read a ton of reviews. And I, boy, that book, huh? That's no joke holding yeah. it up at night. I've read all of his books, yes. Heavy yes. stuff. Like, I mean, it's yeah. literally a heavy book because it's so many pages, but I'm so into it. And also Aramaic, a magical language and yes. sound healing. So yes, on many levels. And I'm curious because I'm a singer and I've had moments where something divine has happened to me. And I'm curious mm. when you talk about this experience and this almost surprise at what came out of you. Was it a feeling of detaching, but understanding the matrix so that you knew where to go, your voice knew where to go? Or was it 
that you really almost abandoned this so that something else could come through? I would say both. So it's a, uh, there's a very conscious checking in that happens where you ask for love and light. And I myself being in being very in touch with my nafsha and having experiences um, on my own sound tables here before I even had this training of just getting kind of downloads that come that land in that are like, say this to this person, do this to this person. It's just like a knowing that happens. And with the voice, what I found was that yes, calling in the love and the light from my nafsha to their nafsha that only what is for the highest good of this person come through. And so therefore my the ego is out of the way. And yeah, it's like it's being tuned into the matrix, being tuned into the quantum, being tuned into to the field where everything is all existing all at one time. So what this person needs is already there, right? So it's our and, and their nafsha is communicating to me what it is. That's how I feel like it works. And um and then, yeah, I allow myself to be an instrument because we're all an instrument, right? So it's like I became, like Gita says, I'm just a flute. And I'm like, yes, I became the flute where it's like it's my my vocal cords are vibrating, my mouth is open, and my heart is open to allow this energy to flow through. And that's just, yeah. And those divine experiences you have when you sing are so real. They're so real. It's vibrational. It's vibrational medicine. Yeah. And this is now, I assume, a part of your practice that you've brought back. Oh, yes. So since I've got back, I've all of my friends, I'm like, I need you guys to come and just give me honest, honestly, what you experience, what you think, what you feel. And um, yeah, so many of them have just been blown away by the experience. And and you know what? What's really the most humbling thing is when you're when you're singing on someone's body and you're finding you listen. It's this deep listening that happens where you hear that something starts overtoning or singing differently on the body. And then you focus on it and you sing on it with a whole tone. And then you find the tone that needs to be on this spot. And I know I hit it when um, my lips start doing this really crazy vibrating thing. I'm like, and this crazy sound starts coming out. And it's like, I couldn't do it if I tried to do it. Um, and so my one girlfriend that I just had here that I did it, and she's a deeply spiritual practitioner too showed me this the spot that i was singing on that i had found she goes just this morning this was hurting me so bad and she lifted up her shirt and she had a scar there where she had an appendectomy that i didn't even know about and that was the exact spot that i picked up that i was singing on with her mm. so it's it's really profound but like the body it's we're energetic beings it's we're vibrational beings so when we learn to listen then the body is singing back mm. oh i love that and Aramaic. So mm -hmm. I got into Aramaic and, and nothing like what you're doing, just cursory, because I was writing, in fact, for the Conscious Life Expo, where I found you, I, I don't even know how many years ago, eight, 10 years ago, when I first started writing books and I was speaking there and I was putting together a speech and I wanted to get a point across. And then I looked up the word abracadabra. And yes. it turned out its inception, its origin roots were Aramaic. And the original word was Avra Kadavra, which means that as I speak, I create, right? Now magicians use this word, but it actually <laughs> is a potent word. Tell yeah. me about the Aramaic and your research and what you have found. Oh my gosh. Well, it's interesting because um, I didn't approach spirituality from a spiritual point of view. I actually accidentally became spiritual. And in fact, I, when I became um, a mindfulness practitioner and studied mindfulness, I did it through UCLA, purely for neuro neuroscience. So I was not at all in the spiritual realm because I was raised Catholic and I became very um, anti-religion, which in my mind, I guess, was all anti-spirituality. So fast forward, my friend gave me a book um, called The Way of Mastery. And I started reading The Way of Mastery and it started talking about Christ consciousness. And I was like, I can't read this, it says Christ. And, she's, and she said, well, just replace it with love. So I said, okay, I can do love consciousness. So then I kept reading this and then it, something in me just triggered. And I started, the question just popped in my mind of like, well, what was the original language? that Jesus was speaking because understanding language the way I love language and you do too, I'm sure as a writer, 
and know that words are such containers of meaning. And so I started looking like, what was the original language of Jesus? I knew it was Aramaic. And so I started looking deeper into it and um, discovered that it's really a language that no one knows the origins. No one knows where it came from. No one knows how it started. It's one of the oldest languages on the planet. Um, it's the language that Zoroastrianism is based on. It's so it's that old. <laughs> and so and then that's the language that that Jesus was speaking or Yeshua was speaking um, and that that was the common language. And so when I started reading into it and noting noticing that, you know, one word means seven or eight or nine different concepts, not even different words, but completely different concepts. So I'm like, oh, that's why he would always say, if you have ears to hear, and then they would have conversations about discourse. How did you hear that? How did you hear that? What did you hear? And it's it just was really um, very eye-opening to me to recognize the languaging that, that he was using in his teachings is really spiritual psychology before there was language for such things. And he was talking about the quantum field, the quantum science before there was languaging for such things. And he under, they understood neuroscience and, the, and quantum physics and psychology long before there was language, languaging for such things. And they, but that's exactly what he's talking about, exactly what they're talking about in everything that he taught. And so it's been my study now, my deepest, my deeper study is now into the Beatitudes and my dive into the Beatitudes in the original Aramaic because um, there's a book that Lars recommended in one of his books, and he mentioned it in just a blurb in a sentence. And so I saw out this book. It's called Unconditional Love and Forgiveness by Dr. Edith Stover. It was written in 1987, and she based it on a work that was done by a man named Dr. Dan McDougald in the Georgia prison system, I believe it was, in the 60s. And he based the work on the Beatitudes and and forgiveness and forgiveness work. And the recidivism rate was so low after doing this work that they, of course, kicked it out of our for profit prison system. They don't allow it in there anymore. So but it's it was really profound when I started um, studying the Beatitudes. I'm like, this, he's talking about this is quantum. The first the first Beatitude is to make yourself at home in the breath. OK, wow. Make yourself at home in your breath. Well, now we're talking about mindfulness. We're talking about the quantum field. We're talking about being here in the breath and being conscious that as we are breathing, we are breathing in everybody else's contribution. We're breathing in the force field of the quantum field. We're contributing to it with our own breath. And it just it's mind boggling. So I'm like, if people even can get that one practice down, stay at home in your breath. <laughs> How many problems does that solve? It's pretty, it's, it just blows my mind. Yeah. Studying, first of all, studying mindfulness at UCLA, that's very impressive. I know their program. I used to live in Westwood on the Wilshire Corridor and every Thursday at noon at the Hammer Museum, right down the block from where I lived, UCLA mindfulness department would show up and take a huge theater mm. audience full of people through their mindfulness practice. And it's spectacular, it's connected to their medicine, their science. So I honor you for that level of education. And when you are studying, I mean, first of all, that's like pretty deep to go into all of this like you are. Well, are there any words in particular in Aramaic that really resonated with you, words that you like to use or put places because of their magic or potency. Oh, absolutely. Um, the shim, the SHM is my favorite word. I end all of my sound baths with it. I teach people to do it because when you, so the shim, SHM, the shim is the, it's the force field. It's the creative field. It's the breath. It's the energy. It's the creative energy of the field that we can tune into. It's the vibrational energy of source and we have access to it and it's called the shim. And so when I make that sound and I invite people to make that sound all the time and I'll just say, take a deep breath in and we're going to exhale and say it three times that people will stop and they'll just be like, wow, I felt that like down in my feet or I felt that in my, I felt it down deep in my belly where I don't usually feel things. And so that is definitely one of my favorite words. And then of course, the nafsha, the word for soul, N-A-P-H-S-H-A. And 
the nafsha in Aramaic, and I'm looking at my window as I talk because I just, it makes me feel so expansive that the word soul is not what the nafsha is. The nafsha is, as, as Yeshua described the nafsha, is, and he said, love your neighbor as you love your own nafsha, not as you love yourself. You love your neighbor as you love your nafsha. And your nafsha is, you can think about it as this organizing principle of self that lives above us. And so I, I think of, um, I kind of just think of like at this light, this little orb that's constantly like lives above me and that that orb has access to the quantum field of all potentialities and it has access to source creator, I the I am source, and that that nafsha energy flows all of that energy down into me, into this body. And I can use this energy and use this wisdom and use this knowledge to the amount that I will to use it because we have willpower, we have egos, we have this will system in us that the more that I will to use this and ask to use this and ask for it to be revealed to me, the more it is. And it's it's like it's like a it's a power source that we all have access to. And um, I love it because using it and tuning into it, I discovered that it indeed does have a different voice. It has a different vibration. It has a different feeling. And so now I know when it's my nafsha landing in me versus my ego. And, you know, it's really interesting because I said one of the ways to know is that we're always in the present moment when we train ourselves to stay present. And this is the this is the creation point now, right? It's always creation point now. And we go with whatever choices we're making in the moment. And ego is always negotiating to not do whatever it is that our higher self wants us to do. And the ego is always negotiating. I'll do it tomorrow. I don't want to do that. I don't feel like doing that. That sounds too hard. Whatever it is that it comes in, that I know that that's when it's my ego because it's always negotiating versus the nafsha is like, do this thing. It, it just is. It's this isness that always invites spaciousness and creation rather than shutting down or contraction. Mm -hmm. And so I love the word Nafsha. And in fact, my license plate says Nafsha. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Okay. And I've got a quote from you that says, through the Nafsha, you're given a body and it came in printed with a divine design of your potentiality, your gene keys. These yes. are the personalities imprinted on your DNA. I've read a just very little bit about gene keys. Tell us what are they? And why are they important? <laughs> so yeah, with our with our physical body that we're born in, in this physical uh, blob of light incarnated into matter, when we were born, it was imprinted, right? So we were imprinted with a personality, we're imprinted with gifts and talents, and we're imprinted with potentials. And the gene keys are a spinoff from human design, if people know what human design is. And Richard Rudd took the teachings from human design and he made it a more contemplative practice. So instead of it being like, you know, here's your box kind of thing like human design does or any of those other kind of things do, he, he made it much more of a contemplative practice. And he broke down the sphere. There's 11 spheres of the gene keys, each sphere. So this is how unusual and how rare we are. So just so people can grasp the math of this. Each gene key, so we have 11 spots of our gene keys, each gene key has 64 possibilities, or you could call them archetypes. Within those archetypes, we have a shadow frequency, a gift frequency, and a city frequency or, a, or an enlightened frequency. So it's an enlightened potentiality that we could reach in our physical incarnation. The shadow, obviously, we all know the shadow because that's how we all behave out of ego. The gift is really the creative possibility and the potentials that you can do in this lifetime. And then, of course, the enlightened state, Very there's been very few enlightened masters on this planet, but we can look at it as um, that is the highest like that's the highest part of my nafsha. If I were to just allow my nafsha to flow through me, that's what it would be. So within each of these 64 potentialities, you have six lines. So it's also based on the I Ching. And so where that line is, is how you personally express that gene key. So you have each of these combinations happening in each sphere. So that just tells you how rare and how unique every person is. And the imprint is both 
conscious and unconscious. So the conscious happens uh, when you're born and the unconscious happens three months before you were born. So you have an unconscious imprint and a conscious imprint. And um, working with the Gene Keys for me ha and for other people I know that have worked with them has been super life-changing. And then what I've done, it's funny that you mentioned them because I've actually taken the gene keys and applied them to the chakras, to our energy centers in our physical body, and then tied that to the Aramaic Lord's Prayer and then created these I am mantras using the Aramaic Lord's Prayer as abracadabra, as you said, as you speak, as you create, and you speak your gifts and you speak your enlightened states and you do this as a form of meditation every single day with some with some certain energetic movements and with sound and after a short amount of time you start to really you know it's almost like you start to um when things are askew and you can start vibrating things back into position and that's kind of what happens you start to see all of the shadow aspects of yourself and in all of their beautiful glory and their wonderful gifts that they're there that they've given you and that they're like they're here to show you oh here's what you've done here's what you've created isn't this delightful now i can choose something else i can choose something higher and something better that's for my best self and for the best of the world because that's the ultimate truth too is that in this work if it's if it's for your highest good it's for the highest good of everyone because we're all connected. And at the nafsha level, at that soul level, at that higher vibrational level, it's not about personal ego anymore. It's not about how can I, how can I be self-important and how can I self-grandize myself? It's about how does this serve? How does this serve humanity? How does this serve everybody's joy and healing? And that's really my passion, what's so important to me, yeah. Is this something that you offer? That, you know, somebody can come to you and give you information and then you detect what their gene key is and you do a reading or is it something that becomes part of your healing work? How does that manifest? Yeah. I do the gene key. I call it a gene keys activation. I don't do readings because it's I honor the contemplative nature of the gene keys. And I feel like, you know, we want... Uh, we're an instant orange juice society, right? We want to we want to shake up the orange juice and pour it in a cup and we don't have to worry about squeezing the oranges. But really the work is it's meant to be slow because we're meant to ripen at the pace of nature. And if you were to, you know, when people have sudden kundalini moments or sudden like poof, you wake up and you're a different person, you can't handle it. You lose your mind. So it's really we're supposed to go at this very slow breath by breath awareness by awareness choice by choice and so i really honor the contemplative nature of the gene keys but i do create for people the i am declarations the i am statements the meditation with the aramaic i'm looking at my little chart up there the aramaic lord's prayer um, and then the sounds the different sounds that you make and then the energy yoga poses that you can do to lock that into your body the somatic experience to keep that in your body. And um, I, yeah, I call it a gene keys activation because simply by doing those words, as you know, just by saying, breathing in and saying, uh, breathing in, and this is one of the meditations. So um, for instance, my gene key of my life's work is the shadow of superficiality, the gift of self-assurance and the cidic state of presence. And so I can eliminate the shadow. I'm not even going to acknowledge the shadow being superficial. I know what that's all about. I've done that, of course. So now it's like breathing. Now I say breathing in, I breathe in self-assurance. Breathing out, I am self-assured. And then I'll do the same thing for presence. And then I'll go through all of my gene keys in that exact same way. And it's just at the end of it, it's very... Um, you just feel it. It's a vibrational resonance that you recognize because it's patterned within your own cellular structure. Mm, sounds powerful. You mention a Magdalene and being a servant of the light. What is being a Magdalene servant of the light? What does that mean? Well, I'm not going to claim to channel because I just I'm not comfortable with that. But I would say that ever since I was a little girl, I've had a very close connection with Mary Magdalene and would I would just remember being out in the woods and always talking to her and like she was always hanging out with me and um, I've seen um, I don't know if it was my light body 
next to my body or if it was somebody or if it was a mag but i think it was a magdalene energy and then i've been told by many people that i carry the magdalene frequency so not you know i don't know what that means i'm not going to say that i i sit around and cherry channel mary magdalene all day long but um it is a it is a vibration and a frequency that resonates with me and i was told about a year and a half ago to do to when i wake up in the morning first thing in the morning to sit down and write and she said, write, ma write your Magdalene pages. And I was like, okay, I don't know what that means, but I'll do it. So I've been doing this every morning and sometimes really beautiful things come through that I'm like, I don't know if it's just the automatic writing process or if it is Mary Magdalene energy that I'm tuned into the frequency, which I believe that's entirely possible. And um, so I sometimes will share these messages if I feel like they are things that people need to hear or if they're but I know the most important message from her is about letting go and coming into the present and what can you do right now and what can we do to serve and to help and to heal other people and to have such profound um, compassion and clear seeing about people's behaviors and what they do and the choices that they're making and to, and to look at people instead of with eyes of judgment, to look at people with eyes of compassion and understanding I'm like oh I completely see and understand why they're doing what they're doing but um, that doesn't mean that I invite them into my home so there's also some very strong boundaries that come along with that mm -hmm. what has Magdalene taught you like what is your understanding of her I, I understand all the myths that mostly men created around her none of which are true mm -hmm. and no. I understand that she was really a priestess <laughs> From the temple of yes, isis and powerful woman very powerful and she taught yeah. alongside of yeshua yes she did she was his partner his koinonos which means his love and um her energy well first of all and i also believe that she is an ethiopian princess so imagine like of course they wanted to squash her out of the church a black woman who's a powerful priestess oh my gosh we can't have that so that, well we need to whitewash her and turn her into a prostitute next to a well no 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 she was a very powerful priestess and she her energy is um oh, her energy is very strong very playful, very lighthearted, very compassionate, full of joy, full of joy, full of joy and humor is like the number one thing. And just she does. She's just a kind of a no nonsense energy is really what it is. It's just um, like in some of the one of the things that she's taught me was about letting go. And I've had her drop in a few times. And one was when I was asking about something traumatic that had happened when I was a child and this person died and I was filled with rage and I was like I want to know why I want to know why this why they did what they did to me and I just heard this voice and I know it was her voice because I recognized it from my childhood and she said why doesn't matter why is a disempowering question and it wasn't about you it wasn't personal and I and with that I just felt like this freedom land on me that I was like, oh, it wasn't about me. That means there's nothing wrong with me. There's not something that I need to fix or take care of. It was like, not about me. The second thing was recently, and it was this year, and it was it came across in my morning writings and my journaling. And I was talking about letting go in my pages. I was like, I'm, I'm, I wanna let go of this thing. I wanna let go of that thing. I'm trying, I wanna let go, I wanna let go. And she said, letting go is as simple as opening your hand and letting go. And she said, or if you prefer, you can create a whole lifetime of things to let go of. The choice is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. It is as simple as letting go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's also not easy because that means, okay, to let go means I'm going to no longer identify with my story. I'm not going to identify with my whatever it is that I'm whatever it is that I'm identifying with that I'm like, oh, I need to let go of this thing because that's who I am. But really, it's boop, gone. Yeah. Mm, energetic release um completely yeah, yeah you well, know and that's one of the that's one of the things that Gita also talked about when we were in Spain was she mentioned about the letting go process and how um that's so like she gets it she was talking about you know letting go means that you just choose to turn a new direction and you're not going to face and deal with that thing anymore because you don't need to you've let it go and now you're in a creation space and I really I really feel that I really feel that energy. Hmm. 
Okay, that's so beautiful. I I may revisit Mary a little bit later, and I want to go into the work you do. So you've studied, as you said, with Geetha Ben David, and mm -hmm. also Roger Love. Everybody mm -hmm. in Los Angeles knows Roger Love. And what else about this huge amalgam of everything you've learned? It sounds like you've taken in a lot of training and then something holy joya came out of you that was created as the work you do. Will you talk about the work and how that has unfolded? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I was talking with my girlfriend about this because I, I, I train a lot in corporate in Phoenix, believe it or not. So, and being such a, a spiritual person and going into, she's like, well, how are you getting in? How do you teach in companies when you have this? And I said, well, I just slap them with the science. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Because like I said, you know, when we go back to what I said about Aramaic and Yeshua, I'm like, he was talking about psychology. He was talking about mindfulness. He was talking about the quantum field. And now we have scientific language that we can put on these things and these experiences. And so for me, it's really about being able to uh, give people the experience first, of, of allowing themselves to have the experience. And then if they so desire, I can explain to them what just happened. What happened in your body? What happened in your mind? What happened in the in the quantum field? What happened? And so I, I kind of have this ability to marry both of those things together um, because I think they belong together. I feel like spirituality or woo woo is just something that people call things that they don't know how to explain. But in the reality, the more that quantum physicists study quantum physics, the more they can't explain anything. So it's kind of, we're kind of back at that, at that full circle where we're in. We are the spiritual, we live in the spiritual, we are vibrational, we, we, we don't even exist. We're like, if we get under a microscope, a subatomic microscope, we're nothing. We're just vibration, we're just a vibration. And so my work is really, when I meet with someone one-on-one -on -one here in my studio, here in my space, is again, I, I do a little intake question. It depends what they're here for. Um, I work with sound. I work with spiritual psychology with sound. So I don't invite the stories. So I do a lot of trauma release with people because this is, for, this is a space, this is work for people who've done the work. So I, for 30 years, I did the work through my mind, trying to heal myself with my brain, trying to heal myself by understanding myself. But it wasn't until I opened my heart that I healed. And so that's the work that I do is the heart opening healing with people and giving them permission to use their voice when they're on my sound table, giving them permission to sound it out. I call it sounding it out. I'm like, if you feel like you want to cry, cry. If you feel like you want to scream, scream. If you feel like you want to grunt, grunt, whatever it is, there are no scary sounds. It's your body wanting to release those things. And we, we know that traumas get stored somatically, that trauma lives in the body and it gets stored in the body. And I also am very much aware of when I'm working with sound um, externally, and now especially with the voice, that it's it's like a it's like a, a release that happens and things loosen up. And so that's not to say that you now sweep it under the rug and you don't deal with it. No, if you need to cry, cry. If you need to go talk to somebody about what's upsetting you, go talk to somebody. But it's that permission about opening up the heart so that you can feel because we have three brains in our body. We have our head brain, we have our heart brain, and we have our gut brain. And all of these science now knows are brains, but we only use this brain in our head. And this is the dumbest brain we have. This is not the brain we're supposed to be using first and foremost. And so my, I really look at my work as um, being able to, to open up and tune back in to the heart brain and to the gut brain, because they're connected and they connect that solar plexus and the heart connect with that little space right here in between. There's a little bridge and it's that that's the bridge of spirit. That's where that's that's where our nafsha connects with us. And that's a that's a that's a spot that when it awakens, you feel it. It's like a little light that burns all the time. And I really feel like that's my work with people is opening that back up, c connecting that back up, letting people know there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing actually 
to be healed. There's just a, a recollecting of who you actually are, remembering who you actually are and collecting all these pieces of yourself and reclaiming all these parts of yourself that somewhere along the line, you agreed to disconnect from because in your tribe, in your family, in your friends, in your circle, you were told that something you are is not okay. And so we learn how to shut that part of us off. We protect it and we lock it away. And so it's really the work of opening that back up so that you can be free to be who you are, who you truly are, so that you can express your gifts in this world. So does somebody have to be with you in person in Arizona to do this and receive this, or do you do this mm -hmm. remotely? I can do it remotely. And then when yeah. you go, I'm so curious. I love the whole corporate thing. It's awesome. <laughs> Busted in. So great. You use the science, you use statistics, but what happens? Like you got all these suits hanging around and then you whip out the uh, crystal bowls and they close their eyes or what is that like? Yeah. Yeah. They close their eyes of, or we do mindfulness. I do mindful art also in corporate. And I explain to them about exercising your brain and that sound, you know, sound vibration. There's so much science around sound that it's, yes. it's a no brainer. It's like, it's effortless meditation. It allows your body to go into rest and reset. You can calm your vagus nerve. You can calm your whole system so that you can stop being in constant inflammation, which is what causes so much sickness. And sound is the number one way to, aside from meditating, to be able to effortlessly drop in and experience that feeling of bliss. And I have had people who come in and they'll just be like, yeah, this is and then at the end will come up to me on the side and be like can you come to my house every night and do that for me? <laughs> i have never felt so relaxed as i just did in that 30 minutes in in years so i'm like yeah it's amazing <laughs> so it's you know and it's really um it's such a gift to be able to give that i worked in corporate america for a long time so i know that stress and the yep. and the having to put on the the corporate face but i feel like that's changing that's changing because we're becoming a more conscious society and you can't just check your consciousness at the door anymore. Yeah. You can't just put in a suit and pretend it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that beautiful explanation, I would be so thrilled if you would be willing to lead us through some kind of a sound healing. I won't pretend to know what you're going to do, but if you want to explain it, not explain it, go into it right away. But if you would gift us with that, I think that would be magnificent. Oh my gosh, I am absolutely honored to gift that and to be doing sound on your show is just so exciting. So give, I'm going to mute myself so you don't hear me clanging around while I set my microphone down and um, I'll be right back. And I'll, I'll be talking while you do that. Uh, so I just want to fill in a little bit because that was pretty incredible. Um, some of the references to the conversation we just had, first of all, when Joya was extremely young, she became connected to source consciousness. So I think it's you know, even beyond the Mary Magdalene experience. And she also offers energetic activation sessions where she combines four powerful modalities into one activation. That's the gene keys that we talked about, the chakra system she mentioned and applying the gene keys to chakras, um, also the affirmations she brought up and uh, focusing on the best possible use of our talents. Boy, I would love to gift this to some of the powers in the world right now because they could be actually very misaligned and be doing great things. I'd actually like to gift that also to computer hackers. That has always been the weirdest thing to me, why somebody would choose to hurt other people's systems and computers because clearly if you have the ability to do that you're a genius right and if you're a genius <laughs> you can instead take that switch train tracks and do so much good on this planet at a time yes. we really need you so that is more about joya and also my 50 cents <laughs> what's going on and now She's going to offer us, this is her studio we're in, and she's going to offer us a sound experience. So I'll let you take over, beautiful creature. All right. So thank you so much, Debbie. And then if you'll do me a favor, since I don't have a, a clock here, if you'll just kind of flag me one time. 
So for um, everybody listening, I will invite you, if you are able, to get into a comfortable position. And if you happen to be driving while you're listening to this, um, you might wanna listen to this portion later because it does change your brainwave states. And I don't want you to slip into an alpha or theta brainwave state while you're driving, that wouldn't be good. So we want you to be safe. So uh, if you're able, close your eyes. And I'm gonna invite you to use your voice also in this session. That only it is for whatever's whoever's listening, the highest good in service of your life and your light come through to you. As you exhale, allow your body to sink and melt and drop away all the stress and tension. And taking a deep breath again, filling up your belly and your lungs. Let out an audible exhale and just go, ah. And then on your own, just do that as many times that feels good to you. responds to your vibration.
I think we need it mic'd a little bit. I can hear it, but I can't hear it very um, loud. I don't know if there's a way, and I know you're already sitting in the midst of all those amazing instruments, but my God, it should it's be so nice. beautiful. I really want people to hear this. Let me check the sound settings down here. Studio Shit. adjustments, folks. Studio adjustments. adjustments. Pleasure. Okay. What was that first just... instrument you were playing, by the way? That ancient, amazing sound. My monochord. I just put the microphones closer. Is that a little Perfect. better? Okay. Thank you so much.
So for this last part, I would love to have you experience sound from the inside out now. And one of the best and easiest ways to take a deep breath, if you're not familiar with using your breath as if you're sitting, to bend forward and exhale all of your breath as you bend forward. And then while you're bent over, take a breath and fill up your belly. And then when you sit up, you'll have a belly full of air and then you'll find you can actually now fill up your lungs with even more air and putting your hands on your lower belly, just go, ah, for as long as you can till you run out of air, just allowing yourself and feel the vibration of emptying yourself and notice if there's any areas of resistance or tension in your heart or in your throat. And if there are, just give yourself permission to just say, ah, anyone can say, ah. So just taking a nice deep breath again. the first part of the AUM, A-U-M. And you can use that sound as an intention to open yourself up, to empty yourself, and to invite in your higher self, your nafsha to fill more of you with the goodness that you truly are. Okay. Thank you. So beautiful. Which ones are your angel sound? The monochord. You'll notice that it makes, did you hear the overtones that it makes? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I call them the sounds from the angels because those sounds and then when I had a, a near-death experience when I was in my 20s I heard the music I heard music and it was music made of light and this these octaves and overtones that happen with the monochord are almost very close <laughs> to that sound that I heard very close yeah yeah wow you you have so much sensitivity I was listening and occasionally watching you, but so much sensitivity about what crystal to use when, having space between sound, allowing a sound to develop before you bring in something else. I was really appreciating that. Yeah, I well, silence is a sound also, right? Mm -hmm. And then that gives us an, a chance to listen within, mm -hmm. to the sound of our own body, to the symphony of our own body and what's what are what's the feeling that's there what sound wants to be made and and then giving giving permission to allow that space to be there symphony of being yes um, i've got a great quote from you joya which is creativity is the journey toward authenticity every time you make a choice to act and do something with intention in your life that's creativity Every time you break an old thought form pattern and expand your thinking, that's creativity. Every time you choose to do the thing your gut tells you to do instead of your head, that's creativity. Deep connection doesn't come from the mind. It arises from being. Will you unpack that for us a little bit? How creativity is important and how we can easily flow from a creative state. Wow. First, I'm like, wow, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, being the space of being in the space of creativity. I feel 
Well, you know, I love sacred geometry. It makes me think of sacred geometry. And in sacred geometry, where there's a point where you're going to create a new fractal or a new part of that sacred geometry is called a coincidence point. So I love that because it's coinciding. And I feel like our whole life is that way, that we are either we are either just going in a circle and not expanding, not creating. We're just going in a circle out of our habit mind, our, our do loops, or we are in a creative space where we recognize that we're at a choice point. And now I can choose to do something different. Yes, it's scary. Yes, it's uncomfortable. And, and as adults, we, we tend to avoid things that make that feel scary or feel uncomfortable, but, but that's not how you are creative. Being, being unafraid to fail because there's no such thing as failure, reframing it as experience and wisdom. Um, every day, every moment, is a completely new opportunity to be creative. And you know, when you ask most people what it is to be creative, they will say, oh, I can't draw something, so I'm not creative. They don't equate that everything you do is creative, how you dress is creative, how you drive is creative, because you're creating. And I, I equate creating with creative. If you're alive and you're breathing and you're choosing in choice point now to follow, that different flow, that different rhythm, that different pattern that wants to emerge from you. That's the ultimate act of creativity. Mm -hmm. Is there anything um, profound between Mary Magdalene and Yeshua that you can share with us that you learned, whether it was about their relationship or what they taught or some kind of powers they had or knowledge? Um, I would love some insight. Mm. Ooh, well, you know, right before I went to Spain, I saw a bumper sticker on a car and it said, Mary Magdalene was the first tabernacle of Jesus. And so I was like, Ooh, that's interesting. So I looked up tabernacle. I wanted to, I mean, I knew what it meant, but I wanted to look it up deeper. And it's like, it's a sacred container. It's a sacred holiness. But I also believe that it's also the other way around that Jesus, Yeshua, was also a tabernacle of Mary Magdalene and her, her holiness. And we know that in the quantum field, in the realm, again, we're going back to the quantum because that's what they were. They understood, they understood how to be completely in, in source, in the space of pure creation all the time, that they knew how to work with the, with the many invisible forces that rule all of our lives. They were they were they were supernatural beings because they they were enlightened they were enlightened masters that got out of there was no ego left they were just completely enlightened masters and they were very much in love with each other they were they were each other's partner and anybody who's been in a in a sacred relationship with uh, whether it's a girlfriend or you know friends a friendship or a spouse if you're fortunate enough to have a divine marriage with somebody then you understand that power that happens that that where two or more are gathered there create there this third thing happens this gestalt the holy spirit the ruka de kudsha the force that 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 starts creating on its own it's like it becomes its own creative force and that happens and and they had that they completely had that that they were able to heal people they were able to share this message and that it wasn't about this is something that only we can do because they weren't they weren't not human that's the other aspect of it even though they became supernatural beings they weren't not human they were human and they gave us this beautiful perfect avatar of our potential as human beings this is the beautiful potential that we can activate within ourselves to step into this space of total love and total openness and total creation and work with the powers that are a force for good. And all we have to do is look to nature to see how she expands herself and that she wants to expand and she wants to expand in creation for the sake of creating. And we are that, we have that. And that is what they taught us. That's what their message was. And that's why I love, you know, I always say, I am so grateful for the brave Essenes, whoever they were that went and hid these gospels, these writings 
in the caves, not knowing when or if they would ever be found, but that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And so we were able to get these these truths that were that were tried that were almost destroyed from history, trying to erase from history the truth of our being, and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene being one of them, the Gospel of Thomas being another of them, and they're just so beautiful and such different teachings that teach us that we have the power within us, we have this ability because we don't have an option. we are an option in a physical blob of light bodiness <laughs> that we can activate and learn to use from a, a higher vibrational way of being and when you know when we if we could even come halfway to that as a human species wow just wow yeah well yeah. joya sosnowski this is dare to dream so what are you next dare to dream what are your future dreams and goals Oh, my future dream is to build a beautiful space like the one that I was in in Spain, this beautiful acoustic big space and to have people come together to sing, to chant, just to sing one note with a monochord and to let that let that go forth because and then to have everybody take this with them and to have vibrator events spread where we're singing outside and just singing one note and knowing that the singing one note and holding an intention of love and peace is imprinting the con the, the collective consciousness and changing the planet because when one of us awakens it wakes up a thousand people if a thousand people awaken it wakes up a hundred thousand people and so it's really about reaching this critical mass of awakening, which I believe we are, we're doing. So that's my, that's my goal. You know, it's just uh, to keep growing, to keep singing and to keep, to keep uh, helping people awaken to their beauty and their wonderful brilliantness that they don't even know that they are. I know that people can find you and your work at viberaiser.com. And just thank you so much for coming on and your willingness to share your gifts with us. Oh, Debbie, thank you so much for having me. It meant so much. And this was such a great conversation. And I appreciate you. And thank you to everybody who's listened. And whew, I just wish you love and light and to awaken to the truth and beauty of who you are. Well, I end today's show with this quote from Joya Sosnowski, and it goes like this. You only have one life. Dare. Dare dare fear is the thief of time and dreams stop wasting your time and energy worrying or comparing or avoiding criticism no one else is you and you are a spark of god at play in this world embrace the miracle that you are and dare today Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share or send it to a friend or family member who you know will resonate with this conversation. Next week, the guest I am featuring is Dr. Joanna Kujawa. She's an author, a scholar, and a spiritual detective for the goddess. Joanna has written books about Mary Magdalene and the goddesses of Eros and Secret knowledge and folks if you're listening on podcasts and you're enjoying it but curious about myself and my guests especially seeing joya play her instruments and give us her gifts please go to youtube.com slash debbie dashinger check us out there and remember dare dare and dare again <laughs>